Good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. Uh, this is a, uh, we're doing this as a series of uh, webinars uh, presented by the Decini Law Office and the Digital Freedom Network um, in celebration of our 20th year. Uh, we're very happy to uh, 
showcase all of these issues that we've come across in our practice in the last 20 years. Uh, and also, I think it's, it's timely right now as we're seeing a lot of digital transformation as a result of uh, the pandemic. And of course, our, our topic today is no exception. And our topic today is the, the digital transformation that we're seeing in the medical field. Um, uh, needless to say, the, the pandemic itself is a, is a medical uh, concern. Uh, but on top of that, uh, the, the doctors uh, continue, there's a need for doctors to continue to serve their patients. And um, in the absence of uh, safety issues that, that need to be uh, addressed at the hospital level, their doctors have had to become more uh, creative, as it were, in terms of uh, rendering service to their, to their uh, clients or cost, I want to say customers, actually patients. Uh, and so we're very, uh, very pleased today to have um, uh, uh, two, two people who I have had the opportunity to deal with on a professional uh, level. They are, uh, I'd like to call them uh, doctornies because they are both uh, uh, doctors of medicine and also uh, holders of uh, degrees in law. And they are licensed uh, both uh, to be doctors and to be lawyers. So if you're ever, if either of them uh, become your doctor, you can say you're being treated by your lawyer. Uh, and so it's one of those uh, unusual situations uh, that we've seen, uh, that I've seen also in, in, while teaching law, that there are a number of uh, individuals uh, who have finished a, uh, a degree in medicine, but then, uh, but then pursue a degree in law. Uh, and so we are, our topic today is telemedicine and the various aspects and concerns on telemedicine. Uh, first to discuss uh, data privacy and uh, the, the concerns in relation to data privacy. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, which is, uh, who is uh, Dr. Ivy Patlu. So Ivy pa Dr. Ivy Patlu is, uh, is a lawyer. She's a graduate uh, from the UP College of Medicine uh, with a degree in medicine and um, and a uh, Juris Doctor degree. So she's a doctor both, both ways, a doctor of medicine and Juris Doctor from the Ateneo Law School. Uh, she um, has a master's in hospital administration from the UP College of uh, Public Health. Um, and uh, she's also uh, was uh, the National Privacy Commission Deputy Commissioner. She was the inaugural Deputy Commissioner. She's the first uh, person to hold that, uh, that position. Uh, a position which she held until uh, until last year in 2019. Uh, she was also a consultant. Uh, she's currently a consultant at the Department of ICT, and she's also teaching uh, a legal medicine, data privacy in Ateneo, in, U in the UP College of Medicine, San Pedro Law, uh, De La Salle University in Pamangtasan, ng Lungsod ng Maynila. I'd like to uh, welcome now Dr. Ivy Pat to uh, to uh, to present her uh, her talk on uh, um, telemedicine. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Let me just uh, slide show this. Okay, so screen is okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking about legal aspects of uh, telemedicine. So as we know, during the pandemic, there was a uh, fast track digital transformation in all areas, medicine included. Uh, there was a lot of interest in telemedicine. But of course, even before the pandemic, there are already a lot of uh, practices involving telehealth. So if we define telemedicine, it's to me the, the simplest definition is that it is practice of medicine over a distance. Okay, so there are different ways of practicing telemedicine. Merong synchronous, this involves real-time consultation, such as when you do a video consultation with a physician, there's a physician on one end and there's a, a uh, patient on the other end. There's also asynchronous telemedicine. This is usually what is uh, done by the National Telehealth Center. So uh, this, for instance, there is a doctor to the barrio in a, a, in a remote location. And the uh, method that is store and forward. So they would send and consult with a specialist, usually in the Philippine General Hospital, and would send pictures or laboratory results so that even if there is no specialist in a... Uh, in a geographically isolated area, uh, meron pa rin silang access to a specialist. Then there's telemonitoring. No? Ang usual na ginagamit na, mobile health technology. There are a lot of wearable devices that would be able to monitor heart rate, temperature. So ginagamit yung telemonitoring. For instance, uh, ICU care. 
So yung mga critical care specialists, they may be just in, in one area and they're monitoring a lot of ICUs from different facilities. No? Of course, mas, mas common siya in other, in other jurisdictions. Uh, telemonitoring also for pain management uh, and uh, monitoring of chronic conditions. So I think the doctor who wishes to start or the doctor already practicing telemedicine has to be clear. Oh, alam niya, uh, may plano siya uh, how he or she intends to practice telemedicine. So for instance, ang gusto ba niya yung diretso sa patient, yung clinician to patient, gusto ba niya uh, he or she will only deal with another cl clinician, meaning uh, gusto niya there is already a doctor with the patient and, and will just be consulting such as, for instance, uh, uh, patients needing specialist care. Or will it be telemonitoring, no? using wearable monitors and other uh, medical technology devices? So, but whatever way or whatever means na gusto ng gawin ng doctor, it's important to remember that a doctor practicing telemedicine, once he or she is engaged by a patient and the physician accepts, then there is already a duty of care to the patient. No? Kahit anong klaseng uh, uh, telemedicine pa yung decide niya. But of course, because of this duty of care, it will be important to prepare. No? Hindi pwedeng basta uh, uh, go without understanding all the responsibilities and obligations and also the benefits. No? Patients should be able to understand the benefits of telemedicine. Imagine that a patient will be able to consult with a doctor without leaving the home. No? Sa panahon ngayon na pandemic, of course, it reduces risks. No? Why, will, why will a patient who can be treated by telemedicine want to go to, to a hospital or sumakay ng public transportation na uh, palit ng palit yung distance? So, you know, all these things. No? So, telemedicine greatly reduces these risks. Um, of course, the goal here sa Pilipinas, we want to institutionalize telemedicine as part of the healthcare delivery network because telemedicine has the potential to improve access to quality care. So now if we're talking about you setting up your own clinic, it will be important to prepare. No? This is a busy slide, but I'll go through the main points of this later. So there's the preparation, how you will set up your clinic from choosing the device that you will use. Will you be using a smartphone? Will you be using a, a computer? How do you collect professional fees? Nakaset up na ba yung billing procedure mo? How will you receive payment? Who will be the people involved and do they have enough capacity to assist or facilitate the telemedicine consult? Because patients, of course, will have to reach you. Paano sila magre-register? Will it be through a technology platform? Will you have a system wherein they have to book their appointments through your secretaries? Then that means the secretary will be part of the, the whole process of providing a telemedicine consult. And then sa practice mismo, uh, there are a lot of considerations. Remember that in the current issuances of the DOH with both UP Manila and the National Privacy Com uh, Commission, there's emphasis that patients, patients would expect the same standard of care in a telemedicine consult as, a, as they would expect in a traditional face-to-face -face consult. Of course, subject to the inherent limitations of delivering uh, medical care through a distance. Then it doesn't end there. Uh, we have to be concerned about follow-up care. And because all this involves transmission of personal information, usually through information communications technology, data privacy and data security become very important. So let me go through uh, the main concerns. No? In the preparation, remember that because it's a change and you're implementing change, it's important to know who will be the people involved. No? A lot of times, there's telemedicine, there's telephone telemedicine. Tinatawagan pa lang. No? Maybe your patients will be calling you and asking for advice over the phone. Maybe the patients will be calling your secretary. Okay, what kind of patients uh, will you accept? No? What kind of patients will you consider as appropriate for a telemedicine consult? And if you are working with your staff, your secretary, and your nurse, how will you build capacity? These are all important considerations when you're starting your telemedicine practice. No? Uh, there must be a clear process where your goals are also clear. Then, of course, ang pinakabago sa telemedicine is because it's a new mode of delivering healthcare. And primarily because you're using information and communications technology. 
you might be using a technology platform. Maybe you signed up for a technology platform available in the market, or maybe your patient does not have access to this and wishes to consult with you via Facebook Messenger. Okay lang ba to? Okay lang ba yung security nito? Security nito? And how will you set up your workspace? So these are important considerations when starting your telemedicine practice. Remember that just as with the use of any other ICT, and in fact, when you're processing personal information of patients, uh, there are risks involved. No? Even the most secure system can be breached. Kung hindi nga ICT and uh, you're doing face-to-face -face consult, you handle a lot of sensitive health information about your patients, then uh, even more so no? when you're transmitting information uh, online, no? your patients might want to send you lab results. Your patients might want to send you pictures of their wounds or pictures of their conditions. So there will be privacy and security risks. Dito sa book na to, yung technology risks na minention, quality of images and uh, suitable uh, equipment and inadequate guidelines. Pero ang isa sa mga technology risks sa atin, of course, the connectivity problem. Uh, what will happen when you're in the middle of the consultation and suddenly umulan, oh, nawala ng kuryente. So paano na ngayon yung, yung consultation if it was caught in the middle? No? So in addition, there are human resource risks. No? Having these risks and understanding these risks should not scare you away from practicing telemedicine because knowing that these risks uh, exist means you can prepare for them. No? Halimbawa, uh, well, maybe I'll be talking about it later, but just as a quick example, halimbawa na, alam mo na yung possibility that there can be disconnections. Pwede talagang mangyari na, na mawala ng internet connection. Ano yung backup mo if that happens? No? So a lot of systems would involve already uh, making sure that the patient can be reached offline, maybe a landline number, or the patient is informed of uh, where to call the doctor, or meron ng plan no? if uh, the consultation is caught in the middle because of disconnections and the patient is really feeling something, maybe even before the start of the consult, the patient is already instructed on where to go. So this is, these are some of the ways of managing risks. Okay. Then capacity building. Huh? Identify people who will participate in the process. Yung sinasabi nilang risks, for example, in telephone telemedicine, baka tinatawagan yung secretary mo, uh, supposedly to schedule an appointment and then the secretary might uh, give medical advice no, offhand and that will be a problem. So you should know who are the people participating in, in the process and uh, they should be clear on their responsibilities. Ang maganda, meron ngayon mga online training on telemedicine. So everyone involved in the delivery of uh, care via telemedicine should be aware no? Um I think yung isa sa mga nakita ko, telephone, telemedicine, Harvard training, and you get a certificate. So there are, there are capacity buildings, building uh, activities available, and a lot of institutions like the National Telehealth Center and uh, UP Manila are conducting a lot of uh, workshops even during the pandemic on telemedicine. Minimum competencies, communication skills. You should be aware, of course, of obligations under the Data Privacy Act, and you must understand the platform that you are using. So kahit naman sa regular, traditional, face-to-face -face consult, communication skills are important. But now, when you're doing telemedicine, may iba siyang twist. No? Before, they will say you have to practice your bedside manner. Now, in telemedicine, sinasabi nila dapat meron kang website manner. How you'll be able to communicate. Like me now, kitang-kita niyo yung mukha ko. So the patient will also see the, the doctor's face and the reactions. No? Kung may tinitingnan mo yung cellphone mo or nagsusat ka kung anong suot mo. The same professionalism no? expected of a doctor in a face-to-face -face consult will be the same uh, expectation also even if it is a virtual consult. So, um, I think ang pinaka-challenge, anong platform yung gagamitin ko? Okay lang ba yung Viber gamitin? Okay lang ba yung Facebook Messenger? Well, I would not recommend using these uh, usual messaging apps, no? But if no choice, then you have to be aware of how you can secure your data and maximize the privacy settings in these platforms. There are also telemedicine platforms available now wherein you can actually uh, sign up. No? May iba free, may iba bayad, may iba mag-uumpisa ka ng bayad sa subscription kapag ka dumami na yung patients mo. 
Uh, so sometimes the telemedicine platform also incorporates an electronic medical record. So you have to, you'll be put in a position where you have to choose which platform to use if you're a doctor intending to practice telemedicine. At the same time, for the patients, uh, pipiliin mo din, alin dito yung mga, kay kaninong doctor ka magko-consult and through what platform. For the doctors, it would be good to look into whether the platform is actually complying with local laws like the Data Privacy Act. Uh, meron ba siyang DPO na pwede mong tanongin about your security and privacy concerns? So it's important. Sometimes it's so easy for us to just tick that box and say, yes, we agree. But you have to read the terms and conditions. No? In a lot, I've tried looking at uh, a lot of the terms and conditions of the available telemedicine platform. So you should be careful because you want to know what they intend to do with the data that you may, you may store uh, in, their, in that platform, data about your patients. Uh, make sure na may hindi siya, hindi siya gagamitin for any purpose. And if it's going to be used for uh, purposes like marketing or sending of emails by the platform itself, then the patient should be aware no? because that is not an expected uh, um, part of the, that's not an expected purpose for the telemedicine consult. Okay, and then it's not all about technology or ICT. A lot of the preparation also goes into the workspace. Uh, imagine how distracting it would be if, for instance, a patient is disclosing to the doctor very sensitive info, then sa likod niya, may mga taong dumadaan-daan. No? In the same way that you want a, a, an environment that is conducive to trust and disclosure and building good rapport with the patient, even more so in a telemedicine consult. No? You want to make sure that there is privacy in the consultation, both for you and the patient. No? Sometimes, uh, may mga telemedicine consults wherein uh, you want the patient to be with someone na may meron siyang guardian o meron siyang kasama. No? So part of the, the consideration yan lahat when you're starting or already practicing telemedicine. Okay. So uh, in the end, no, you have to have clear policies and procedures. Uh, how the patient can contact you. What are the existing um, guidelines? You have to uh, integrate the procedure for obtaining consent in the processes. No? Uh, usually, ginagawa to, yung iba, even before the start of the consult, they already obtain the patient's consent for uh, telemedicine. Then you have to set up your billing policy and procedure. Uh, if you are... If, if, can charge for a telemedicine consult? Yes. Do some HMOs cover it? Yes. Some HMOs already cover it. Is it covered by Phil? But you know, they're, they're, I think they're already working on it. There are talks now no, to have to in, include this in the primary care uh, package. Pero siyempre, ano pa yan? In the works pa. Um, so you also have to have protocols in case of interruptions or disconnections. So during the consult, what are the important considerations? First, transparency. Transparency is important not only for data privacy purposes wherein you have to inform the patient about uh, how you intend to use his or her personal data, but it's also important for the telemedicine consult itself. Patients should be aware of the benefits and risks of telemedicine and they should be given a chance to refuse a telemedicine consult. Yung doctors na nagpa-practice ng telemedicine na, alam nila minsan that some patients are not comfortable uh, for a telemedicine consult. So, hindi mo siya ipupush. Um, ma mararamdaman mo yun. Some, uh, still, now, kahit ngayon, there are still patients who would feel na hindi sila na -e examine or parang hindi same sa traditional face-to-face -face consult yung treatment nila sa telemedicine consult. So, you should be able to communicate well with the patient and if the patient is not comfortable then maybe telemedicine is not for that particular patient so how do you practice transparency well uh, this can happen uh, at the start of the consultation you can inform the patient about these risks or if you have a professional page a website a, a professional profile you can already include frequently asked questions or privacy notices in that uh, profile or, or website. Okay. 
consent. No? Bakit required yung consent? Inadopt na siya ng mga guidelines ng DOH and it's also part of best practice. So currently, consent for telemedicine should be obtained prior to the consult and for every interaction. So when you're using third-party platforms, sometimes the consent of patients is built in no? because once the patient signs up for the platform itself, they're already asked for a consent for the telemedicine consult as well as the use of the platform. You, as the physician, if you're the physician, you should be aware of what these patients are signing up for. No? Kailangan alam mo din ano ba yung consent form na pinipirmahan nila. Because if there are any other uses of their data that uh, is not normally expected, it will be your duty to inform your patients that their information is being used this way. So even if there's already a built-in uh, consent form, you can consider using separate consent forms. Maraming templates available. Again, the UP Manila has uh, provided templates for telemedicine. It's available online. Um, so how do you go about this? No? Yung iba, pwede naman yan. send mo sa patient beforehand. They can sign it, take a picture, and send it back to you. Uh, what's important is part siya ng process so that you don't forget about uh, the importance of consent. Kung, gusto mo, kung separate consent siya at wala pang consent for instance in platform. Okay. As to data privacy, remember that under the Data Privacy Act, same as with the traditional face-to-face -face consult, you generally can process personal information, even sensitive personal information of your patients, like health information, without consent if the purpose is medical treatment. But for all other purposes, then it will require a separate consent. No? Consent should be obtained if you're doing video and audio recording. Uh, kung hindi medical no? because uh, telemedicine is also an opportunity to do research, consent of patients should be obtained for this purpose as well. Okay, then, uh, ano bang standard of care expected? No? Ang nuances ng, ng DOH with other agencies, uh, for these issuances of uh, DOH with other agencies, they say that the standard of care is the same. Meaning you don't change the way you prescribe, you don't change the way that you take the history of the patient. No? You still rely on your own, the same, the same medical judgment that you would exercise in a face-to-face -face consult. Um, pero ano bang difference? No? Because it's with inherent limitations of telemedicine. Telemedicine, ang physical examination lang usually na kaya mong gawin ay visual and Hearing, maririnig mo yung paghinga ng pasyente, ma-examine mo siya. Usually, you may require assistance no? in the conduct of the physical examination. But, kailangan mo pa rin mag-deliver ng same quality of care. So, anong importante? In our jurisdiction, it says that if you think that you're not capable, if you, once you accept a patient, it means you represent that you have the, the skill and the knowledge and the training to treat that patient, that patient's particular condition. So if, halimbawa, na feeling mo hindi appropriate ang telemedicine for that patient and that a face-to-face -face consult is necessary, then the patient should be so informed that hindi mo na ipupush yung telemedicine uh, go to, to a hospital or needs further examination. So, uh, challenge for physicians and also the specialty societies. No? You have to establish guidelines for patient selection. Which patient, uh, what, uh, what is your criteria for patient selection? Anong pasyente ang mga appropriate for medical care, for, for uh, medical care through telemedicine? For instance, may mga iba in other jurisdictions, no? they only want to do a telemedicine consult for old patients, meaning patients that they already have a relationship with. No? Um, then, of course, pagka new patients, uh, pinipili nila ito for, for instance, for chronic conditions that will re require long-term monitoring. So there must be guidelines, which is the most appropriate ones to determine which patients are selection can be developed, as well as guidelines for examination of patients. No? Um, pero hindi naman na bago. No? Halimbawa, when, when you talk about uh, ophthalmology, maraming mga 
uh, technical, uh, technolo technological devices that can even assist in the examination. No? Pwede mag visual acuity testing na, na kahit via telemedicine console. No? Um, pati nga yung mga, as I mentioned kanina, may mga wearable devices that can help in monitoring. So, how you examine the patients, no? you have to be clear. Paano ba? Paano mo ba i-check yung breathing? Uh, paano mo ba i-check yung lalamuna? No? So, Alimbawa ngayon, alam ko yung may ibang doctors, no? they would require the patient to be with someone so to, to help and facilitate in the uh, physical examination. The physical examination in the telemedicine consult, remember that the patient plays an important role. Parang partner mo siya in, in the conduct of these examinations. As to the DOH NPC's memorandum circular, they also have some guidelines. No? So here, I just highlighted some parts no, as to the standards that you're expected to follow. Number one is that the physician is responsible for coordination of care. Of course, this circular in, was, was uh, responsive to the COVID crisis, kaya meron silang gantong, gantong circular. So coordination of care, this is the same duty na meron naman talaga yung mga physicians, may, may duty ka of continuity of care to your patients. Then um, emergency and serious conditions, these are not appropriate for a telemedicine consult. Kung in the middle of the consultation mo na realize na emergency and serious, then you should inform the patient. And kaya importante yung coordination of care, you should be able to direct the patient where to go. Ikaw pa rin ba yung physician niya o may kausap ka na, may ka-network ka na uh, kung saan mo i-refer yung patient kung may kailangan na uh, further interventions. Uh, additionally, this guideline also says that you have to document, you have to keep records of uh, abstracts and prescriptions. Yung sa prescription na requirement na you keep a copy, it's also in the issuances, uh, the issuance of the FDA. No, now the e-prescription is allowed. Again, it's responsive to the COVID crisis, so it's allowed for individuals vulnerable to COVID, but it includes those with chronic illness and persons with disabilities. So here, here are the highlights of that uh, issuance. And I want to point out that it says that you have to keep records of all the electronic prescriptions that are issued. Uh, so itong mga e-prescriptions na to. So finally, kung importante ang documentation in the traditional face-to-face -face consult or when you're seeing patients in the hospital, uh, di ba sinasabi nga, if it's not written, it did not happen. So it's similarly important in a telemedicine consult. Not to mention that specific documentation is required, for example, for e-prescriptions. You keep a copy of these prescriptions. Uh, then you have to also document the consent of the patient for telemedicine. Okay. So final, uh, I mentioned naman to mga data privacy, but the final uh, tips on data privacy, remember to be transparent about data processing. Collect only information that is necessary. Use patient information for medical treatment only unless the patient consents to other purposes. You have to protect the confidentiality of the patient's information. You secure it against unauthorized access. Doctors that are using uh, electronic documents and digital files should be familiar on the use of encryption. Paano mo po protectahan tong mga documents na kinikip mo about your patients? Have backup of important files and uh, be ready to address the concerns of patients. No? Especially when you're doing telemedicine, patients might have privacy concerns, so you should be ready to address these concerns and you have to be prepared in case of a breach. Remember, even if only one, isang pasyente lang, one patient's data has been compromised, that is already, if it involves medical information of the patient, that is already a reportable breach. No? You already have to notify the National Privacy Commission for it. Okay, so uh, that is uh, all for, for this part. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Talk Ivy. Uh, let me see. Okay. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, hold on. All right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Talk. So a uh, very comprehensive uh, discussion on the data privacy uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, telemedicine. I'd like to introduce now our uh, second speaker, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Joel Macalino, uh, who is also uh, an attorney. He's the general counsel for St. Luke's Medical Center. Uh, he's a graduate of the UP College of Medicine uh, and uh, finished his law at San Beda College of Law in Lyceum. 
Uh, he's uh, um, a doctor at the De La Salle Health Sciences Institute. Uh, he took his residency at the Philippine General Hospital. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Joel, we, we both served in the Philippine College of Surgeons uh, Ethics Committee. So I think uh, um, in that sense, he's actually well, uh, well suited to, to discuss today's uh, topic, which is uh, uh, ethical issues and other uh, legal issues relating to uh, telemedicine. Uh, welcome, uh, Doc, uh, Doc Joel. I think you're, you're still on mute right now. So I'll ask you to unmute. There you go. Good afternoon. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, JJ. Um, so this is my presentation. Uh, I listened to Commissioner Ivy, and uh, probably I was, I I, I uh, can choose to forego my presentation and just uh, go with the question and answer. But then, sayang rin naman to. This is uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting me here and presenting. I, I heard that there are about 300 or more uh, registrants. I wish to thank all my relatives for registering <laughs> this afternoon. Anyway, uh, my emphasis for today in telemedicine is that ethical and other legal issues. I'm Dr. Macalino. So this is the outline of the presentation. Of course, this was defined already by Dr. Ivy. And in the College of Law, we say laying the predicate, is it the practice of medicine that has been answered already, confidentiality and duty of care. Medical negligence may be the, um, one of the more important things in telemedicine. And then we go into special problems, meaning recording and e-prescription, and then the conclusion or the final words. The World Health Organization has defined that telemedicine as delivery of healthcare where distance is a critical factor. It uses information and communication technologies in the treatment and prevention of diseases. Well, the second definition was the continuing education of healthcare providers, actually. So some would say that that first aspect of this definition may be telemedicine, and the second aspect is that of telehealth. But then I reckon that uh, telehealth is a broader uh, thing but then most of them, most of uh, other people would consider telemedicine and telehealth as this one and the same thing. So we go to the Medical Act of 1959. Telemedicine, is it the practice? Is it a practice of medicine? Well, Section 10 of the Medical Act of 1959, uh, subsection A, would define uh, practice of medicine as physically examining any person to diagnose, treat, operate, and then prescribe remedy. However, section B or subsection B would define again uh, the practice of medicine as through radio, television, and, on, and any other means of communication to diagnose, treat, operate, and prescribe remedies. The first section, section subsection A, is the traditional and probably because of that or any other means that would encompass telemedicine. Wait. Yani naghang. Hello. Um. Sorry, sorry for that. No problem. Okay. There you go. Okay. The second definition B is one that uh, actually defines telemedicine. Can you imagine that? In 1959, they already, uh, they did not know that they are already defining the practice of, uh, practice of medicine or telemedicine as a practice of medicine. But then, can telemedicine be also subject to illegal practice of medicine? Of course, when you're not a doctor, that's immediately an illegal practice of medicine. If you don't have your certificate of registration, or if you did not renew your license, that can be illegal practice of medicine. This, is, this was also referred to by Dr. Patdu, uh, DOH NPC, the National Privacy Commission Memorandum Circular 2020-03, wherein they define actually telemedicine, the practice of medicine using electronic and telecommunications technology for the delivery of healthcare at a distance. 
So if it is practice of medicine, then it is subject to confidentiality, physician-patient relationship, and even duty of care. This is section 24 of rule 130 of the revised rules on evidence uh, disqualification by reason of privilege communication. Well, the relationship between the physician and the patient is privileged. The physician cannot in any civil case without the consent of the patient examine, uh, be examined as to any confidential communication made for purposes of diagnosis and treatment. Some would say that the communication is privileged as defined in uh, the case of Chan versus Chan because or for the reason that it should encourage the patient to open up to his or her physician so that the physician can make a correct diagnosis as to the ailment and provide adequate or appropriate cure. This was also referred to the Lucas versus Tuano case in 2009 and talks about the duty of care of the physician. Every physician in treating his patient is under a duty of care, which means he should exercise the degree of care, skill, and diligence which a physician in the same general neighborhood and same general line of practice is supposed to or ordinarily should possess or exercise. Now, these are the um, physicians' breach of, breach of duty of care may give rise to these liabilities. Now, these are the basis of medical malpractice, at least in the Philippines. You have administrative liability, which means uh, either the PMA code of ethics or sometimes in every professional organization of doctors in the Philippines, each professional organization would have a code of conduct. So violations of that code of conduct and the PMA code of ethics would be would give rise to administrative liabilities. Under civil liabilities, you have violations of 2176 and violations of 19, 20, and 21. These are the um, civil code provisions on human relations. And of course, you have criminal liability under Article 365 of the revised penal code. And of course, right now we have, since 2012, we have violations of the pre data privacy act. Each of this breach of duty would constitute medical malpractice and or negligence. Now, most of the ethical aspects are under that administrative, under A, ethical aspects in the practice of medicine. The legal basis of medical malpractice, again, in Medical Act of 1959, you have Section 24, which is the grounds for reprimand, suspending, and revoking the certificate of registration. Under subsection 2, that's immoral or dishonorable conduct. Section 5, gross negligence and ignorance or incompetence. And under subsection 12, that's code of ethics or violation of the code of ethics of the Philippine Medical Association. Now, as to that code of ethics, in the code of ethics itself, it mentions unethical practice and unprofessional conduct. Here it is. Now, this is the PMA Code of Ethics Implementing Guidelines, the Philippine Medical Act of 1959, Code of Ethics issued by the Medical Philippine Medical Association should be complied with by all physicians, whether they are members or not of the Philippine Medical Association. They are, uh, violations of such may, be, may constitute an ethical practice and unprofessional conduct. They are, or they can be grounds for reprimand suspension. And again, those, that thing regarding expulsion. So some would say, how can you be expelled when you are not a member anymore? Well, um, renewal of uh, the membership to the Philippine Medical Association entitles you to a lot of things. First is to join or to be a member of the PhilHealth as a provider. And uh, you cannot renew actually your medical license if you are not a member of the Philippine Medical Association. 
This is the PMA Code of Ethics. And Article 2 uh, is actually about the duties of the physician towards the patient. It has several more articles there uh, as shown in the left-hand side of the screen. However, what is more, most important here is Section 5 and Section 6, which actually list down all the uh, ethical violations of a doctor. What is important here is actually the informed consent. No? It shall, uh, a physician shall obtain from the patient an informed consent. It, it, it seems to be a mandatory provision. So this becomes important in telemedicine. And under seven, uh, Section 6, the physician should hold sacred and highly confidential whatever he discovers or what be discovered during this telemedicine in our practice. This is a sample of the PMA consent form for telemedicine. Again, what uh, Dr. Ivy told you is that there are a lot of uh, sample forms. The PGH has one. Each hospital may have one. But then the most important thing are the provisions of this informed consent. So the potential risk, look at the, uh, the risk there. I understand that there are potential risks for using technology, and this is with reference to telemedicine. The data privacy and confidentiality of the consult. The limitations of the consult, basically this is with reference to the signal, the computer, and audibility, and the, and the likes. And of course, the rights of the patient. The patient has the right to ask a non-medical staff to leave the telemedicine conference room, to terminate the telemedicine con consultation and the physician-patient uh, relationship anytime, to obtain copy of the information obtained and recorded, and to be assisted by a family member or a caregiver. And lastly, in case of urgent concern, that he or she may be directed to a um, to uh, obviate or to stop the telemedicine conference and be at the emergency room of any hospital. Of course, the civil aspect of uh, medical malpractice is under 2176 of the Civil Code, which would read whoever by act of or omission causes damage to another, there being fault or negligence, is obliged to pay for the damages done. This is in relation to 1157, which actually um, states that obligations may be from that one quasi delic. But then in, 19, in 2014, in the case of Alano versus Logmao, actually it is in the concurring uh, decision of Mr. Justice Leonen. He said that we can use chapter two on human relations. That is Article 19, 20, and 21. Let me read them for you. Every person must, in the exercise of his right and in the performance of his duty, act with justice, give everyone his due, and observe honesty and good faith. I reckon that if you will be using human relations, you must be or you should be using Article 19 together with Article 20 or together with 21. Why? because it is in keeping with 2176 because of the phrase shall indemnify. And let me read it again for you. Every person who contrary to law willfully or negligently causes damage to another shall indemnify the same. And for Article 21, shall compensate any person who willfully causes loss or injury to another in a manner that is contrary to moral, good customs, policy, shall compensate the latter for the damage. Again, looking back at Article 19, walang bayad po dyan, no? As opposed to 2176, wherein that person is obliged to pay. So again, take a home message, use Article 19, or do not use it at all. Use 20 or 21. This is the chapter, the sole chapter on criminal ne negligence under Article 365. You know, that's very difficult to memorize. But then 
in law we are we are uh, mandated to memorize at least the elements these are the elements of reckless imprudence in order to be liable of criminal negligence you should be you should have the elements of reckless imprudence that offender does or fails to do an act that the failure to do an act is voluntary it's without malice material damage resulted and that one inexcusable lack of precaution in the vernacular what it's what is that that is called walang patong mga patonggaling pagwawalang bahala now that is very difficult to prove if you are a doctor medyo lamang ka na dyan. mahirap i-prove po yung inexcusable lack of, of uh, precaution now this was also cited by um dr patdo if uh how do you prove duty of care how do you prove that well first is to prove that by learned treaties yung mga libro yung mga journals no learned treaties but then the most common way to prove that is actually through an expert testimony well the problem with expert testimony not all will be treated as an expert so as an expert witness you have to show that uh, to show the standard of care that the defendant was um, bound to follow the standard of care and there was he fell below or she fell below the conduct of uh, the standard of care below that standard and that falling below such standard or not practicing such standard of care cause the injury so yun lang ang kailangan natin i-prove but then again that is difficult to prove first you will be questioned as to their qualification of your expert witness giving his expert testimony and giving the standard of care Of course, we have to establish the negligence, or sometimes you, you, when when you want when you are uh, to establish the negligence in uh, telemedicine, the complainant. If you, that you are a complainant, he must present the testimony of an expert witness. Again, there are a lot of uh, jurisprudence regarding this. Usually, he should be in the same line of the person who did not follow standard of care like for example if i'm a surgeon and i'm a member or a fellow of the philippine college of surgeon you have to present somebody who is also a surgeon and a fellow of the pcs hindi po pwede nagtutuli lang talaga dyan, but then he should have the proper training as that of a fellow of the philippine college of surgeon the proof of breach alone is not sufficient negligence there should be causal connection between the breach that he did not follow standard of care and the resulting injury again the negligence must be the proximate cause of the injury so if uh, a telemedicine physician's breach of breach of duty or standard of care it should be again the proximate cause the physician may be held liable for the injury but then we have to look at the limitations of technology possibility that information provided by the patient may have been incorrect or at least lacking so temper muna natin ang mga um, problems with uh, telemedicine as of the moment under Republic Act 420 of the Wiretapping Act, it is unlawful. Can a telemedicine practitioner record the consultation? Just like what we are doing here, at least it has to be authorized by all people. Diba? Sasa consent is a must. Consent for, from the patient and consent from the doctor, from the doctor before you can record a telemedicine conference. Uh, regarding electronic prescription, well, electronic prescription is an optical data of a captured image, maybe PDF, JPEG, or photo file format, issued by or made by a licensed physician. It can be generated, sent, received, and through email, any email messaging 
applications. And then this electronic prescription can be uh, honored by the um, pharmacist in the drugstore or pharmacy. It also includes the digital signature, the name, and the license number of the physician, his or her physician, uh, PTR, and that they, he should keep a copy of the electronic prescription uh, in the patient's uh, compilation of medical records. Regarding electronic document, as opposed to the, as defined by Electronic Commerce Act of 2020, even that prescription is an electronic document. It shall have the legal validity and enforceability of any other document or legal writing. So um, to end this uh, mini lecture, this time is still the time of pandemic, which enhances the need to innovate the delivery of medical support, diagnosis, treatment, and this is actually through telemedicine. Telemedicine is a practice of medicine. Thus, it is subject to ethics, confidentiality, and even duty of care. Regulations applicable to telemedicine are existent, but then here in the Philippines, you know, it's rather new, at least at this time, but then it has its roots in, 19, in 1994 or 1993 with the establishment of the telehealth center of the UP. Since it's new, gaps in the practice of telemedicine still exist. And then, of course, the informed consent on the limitations of telemedicine and all other things provided should accomplish or should be accomplished prior to telemedicine. Thank you very much, um, JJ. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Ivy. Thank you, Doc. Uh, let me see. Okay, let me just stop the screen. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, can we ask, uh, well, we can ask uh, Dr. Ivy to turn on her. Uh, no, our, uh, there you go. Hello. Uh, so we are now uh, going into the Q&A. Uh, there are a lot of questions, actually. But before we go there, I just wanted to uh, quickly uh, mention, so I was making a list here of the, we asked people where they were from. There are actually about 400 people here. Uh, I'm seeing about 80 in, uh, in, uh, on Facebook uh, because we're streaming live on Facebook. Uh, I just want to shout out there are people all over the country uh, with us. So I'll just uh, name the places where they're coming from. So Batak, Ilocos Norte, La Union, Cabanatuan, Quezon Province, San Fernando, Pampanga, Malolos, Bulacan, Quezon City, Marikina, Makati, Taguig, BGC, Manila, Pasay, Mutinlupa, Las Piñas, Cavite, Occidental, Mindoro, Lipa City, Daraga, Al Albay, Cebu, Sabaste, Antique. And we even have uh, somebody coming in from, uh, from Singapore uh, who uh, uh, Dr. Ivy knows. <laughs> uh, so she's listening in, our, our, our previous guest. Uh, so we're happy, you know, we're, we're reaching out to a lot of people. Uh, so we're very happy with, uh, uh, thank you for sharing your, your, your time and your expertise with us. You know, you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Dr. Joel, about the, the UP Telehealth Center in, uh, uh, that was established in UP. Was it, did you say 19, in the 1990s? Yes. Um, well, um, there, it started with the book of um, the former secretary of uh, health. Diba? Yung ano, doctor to the barrios the, during the time of um, President Ramos. What's his name? Um, Dr. Anyway, Flavier. Dr. Flavier, yes, yes. That's right. Then he is friends with the former um, um, chancellor of UP Manila. And the, since UP at that time, in fact, Dr. IB has more information about this. He, he, she wrote an article about this. Uh, IB, pwedeng ikaw na mag... mag, mag uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for... Uh, oh, si IB pero, ang mas magaling. Pero mas matagal na sa PGH si Dr. Joel. No? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yes, well, the National Health Center, of course, uh, ngayon kasi mas parang naging uh, common in telemedicine. No? But it's really... Uh, uh, an institutional advocacy. 90, I, I'm not sure of the exact year. So, in advocate nila 
not just uh, the e-health bill but the telemedicine bill no ang, ang end goal is uh, to make it institutionalized uh, part siya ng healthcare provider network so parang automatic pag walang meron ka ng mga telemedicine uh, involve ang institutions covered ng PhilHealth uh, yun yung goal no because Really, telemedicine now, of course, is serving uh, the needs of the pandemic. Naging responsive siya, kaya maraming gumamit. But uh, more than this, yung potential ng telemedicine, mas malawak. No? It will, right. it has the potential to improve access to quality care, especially in geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas. And UP Telehealth has done a lot. Mula dun sa pag-create ng mga technologies tulad ng Rx Box. Yung sinasabi mo, attorney kanina, yon may ECG, tsaka I think fetal uh, monitoring. So it's a device that they can use and transmit the, the signals directly to another, to a doctor, no? may central hub. So all this uh, has been going on. Uh, silver lining siguro ng pandemic na parang ngayon, mas marami nang gustong sumaporta sa sa telehealth bigla because they realize that it does serve a lot a lot of things. I think we met. That's where we met, no? Yes, yes. Uh, so, Dr. Patlu, we met there. And I just, I just want to point out that uh, uh, one of the, the moving forces in that, uh, in that institution was uh, Dr. Alvin Marcelo, who is uh, coincidentally working with uh, uh, Dr. Joel in uh, St. Luke's right now. So uh, I've heard that name for a long time. He even, uh, I think... Uh, uh, Supported open source software, or open open, uh, ano, uh, which is one of the leading centers in uh, in the country for that. Okay, we have a lot of questions. I've never seen so many questions. Uh, here we go. Nako, I don't even know where to start. So there's, they're thanking you for all of that. Um, okay, so I guess uh, for, maybe we'll 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 uh, no, first on the the questions. Are there questions on the platform? Do they need to subscribe? Do do patients need to subscribe? Uh, or do doctors need to, to subscribe to a particular platform? Um, will, will I, ako muna, Doc? So maraming, maraming ways, no? Merong mga parang ino-offering mga companies that you will, sub, uh, for the patient, that you will subscribe na may parang yearly or monthly fee, then parang only consult to a doctor. May ganong klaseng telemedicine in which the doctors are, are like uh, parang... Uh, ano bang tawag doon? Yung hindi sila, uh, su sinusuelduhan sila nung company itself. So something like that. Then there are also those wherein the patients can sign into the platform, provide some of the details, and then they will be given a list of doctors. Depende sa specialty, pipiliin nila. Uh, the fees can be paid through the platforms. So mayroon mga established na platforms sa ganon. Then, ang sa tingin ko na mas maraming nangyayari ngayon, uh, just using messaging uh, the, the available systems to do the consultations. Uh, kasi karamihan ng patients, for instance, sinasabi nila, uh, ang kaya lang nilang gawin ay mag-Facebook mag Messenger. Or, you know, may limitations din sa patient side, whether it's the connectivity or yung data na kailangan for a particular app. So, yun yung mga three kinds. Then, of course, yung mga institutional no? within the Four kinds pala. Yung isa, institutional. So within uh, within hospitals, meron silang ganyan. Or uh, UP Telehealth na uh, engaging doctor to the barrios, then nakalink sa PGH. So depende sa kung ano yung needs mo, um, uh, yun yung mga options no, for telemedicine now sa Philippines. And and uh, Doc Joel, I mean, are you, are you seeing that... Uh... The telemedicine uh, platforms are uh, are they more um, independent of the hospitals, or are, are the hospitals uh, entering this space as well, or maybe other private groups? What are what are you seeing? Well, I think the hospital has to enter telemedicine platform, but then again, big companies like a uh, pharmaceutical industry are offering a uh, telemedicine platform for free, so. Okay, that is a good come on for the doctors, no? But then let's uh, look at the ethical issues there. Probably you are, well, not compelled, but then for lack of a better word, no? to, to um, use some of their products if the, your uh, telemedicine is being uh, 
well, that's a, a, a that may be a problem if the telemedicine right. is being sponsored by uh, some independent groups who are also sellers or um, commercial uh, establishments, something like that. Right, right. Uh, yes, go, go ahead. Just to know, yung, ang isa pang concern din doon, not that it's bad, no? Uh, but you have to be more careful about the personal information of patients when in, when it's in that setup. Kasi yung data ng patients, importante siya ng mabuti sa mga pharmaceutical companies. So we just have to be careful about uh, looking into the data privacy aspect. Not that it's bad. No? Baka magalit yung mga pharma. <laughs> Ibig sabihin lang, more, more care has to be given no? when processing personal data in that way. Yes. Okay, there's a question here uh, about diagnostic devices connected to to the internet. I think, no, to communicate to the doctor. And then there was another question, which you know, the, some of these questions I think are asked by doctors, eh, because uh, there's a word here. I was I saw it earlier, and I almost could not read it. Uh, but I think it it also it's related to how can you do things obviously remotely. Uh, you can't really see, diba? normally face-to-face uh, -face is so much easier. Um, but I think one is if you attach a device to say the cell phone of the, of the user, of the patient, and then that device now sends information to the doctor, do you see any problems in relation to that? Well, I think that is part of um, or the limitations of uh, telemedicine that uh, you have to enhance your observation through the attachment uh, of these devices. No? Basically, in telemedicine, what you start with is just observation. Look at the part of the patient. Is the abdomen uh, enlarged? Something like that. What are the lesions of the patient? But then if you can enhance your, your um, diagnostic uh, acuity through the use of these devices, even the um, vital signs of the patient, then that is better. But then, of course, it is also subject to, again, uh, as probably Dr. Ivy would mention, some data privacy aspects. Right. Uh, Actually, I found the question. Here's the question. Let's see if I read it correctly. Uh, if there is a need to auscultate or palpate, how will this be done through telemedicine? I have no idea what that question was. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So sometimes, ang, uh, mer marami kasing mga guidelines, no? Actually, uh, if you're practicing in a particular specialty, search ka ng mga journal articles nung kung paano nila ginagawa yung examination. But palpation, you'll have to rely on the verbal description of the patient. So, hmm. uh, kumbaga nga, uh, partner mo talaga yung patient. And auscultation, although hindi ko pa siya nakitang ginawa sa Pilipinas masyado. Uh, Attorney JJ, ito lang yung pag nakastetoscope ka tapos uh, oh, okay. papakinggan mo. <laughs> no? Merong digital, no? but uh, that's why I think it's an exciting field both for research and innovation. Kasi tayo dito sa Pilipinas, hindi pa natin nagamit lahat ito. So yung auscultation, there are actually digital uh, uh, devices halos uh, maraming ganon no so uh, kahit nga yung pagpicture ng ng sa mata uh, hindi ako uh, oh. uh, so para makita yung examination ng mata sa loob meron ng mga ganong devices so the technology is exciting but as uh, Dr. Joel said of course there are, there are a lot of privacy concerns no but I hope that these concerns or these risks won't stop us from maximizing uh, technology personally I'm not not a specialist of any kind but I'm excited by by all the possibilities of uh, of telemedicine sa ngayon ipapa describe gano katigas yung nap na halimbawa may bukol na ang na, na, na ano ko sa mga colleagues uh, gano katigas yung bukol para ba siyang tennis ball para ba siyang uh, yung you know you have to rely on the on the description of uh, the patient so maganda na parang kumbaga doctors have to relearn it in med school you, you're taught that history is very important physical examination tinuruan ka yun ng isa sa mga unang lessons so ngayon ganun din for telemedicine uh, hmm. panibagong learning curve kung paano mo gagawin 
um, but I have watched a lot of, tinignan ko anong meron, meron na ngayon eh. Merong mga, imagine YouTube, merong mga YouTube guide on physical examination for a telemedicine consult. And again, I'm sorry I keep mentioning UP, pero dami kasi silang ginagawa doon. <laughs> meron na rin sila ng mga guidance for physical examination that I think they are also uh, disseminating. No? Uh, even uh, rubrics for your, your communications na pwedeng gawin. So, uh, there, there are guidance available in the Philippines. Pinipilit mag-catch up ng literature and, and studies on this. Uh, so, doctors, uh, ano tayo? Kumbaga, uh, you, you have no cause for worry, I think. You know, um, yung capacity building can catch, can, ca can catch up with the current yeah. uh, requirements. By the way, DJ, no, I'm yes. not a graduate of the UP College of Medicine. I only took my residency there and my fellowship. I'm from ah, Delaware. Okay. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I, uh, no, no, I was no, just no. going by... Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's okay. I apologize for that. Um, I, I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Joel. No? Um, because it, there's telemedicine. It, it occurs to me that actually on the, on the one hand, I think it's good because if you are a doctor... Uh, in a faraway place uh, where there is no specialty, telemedicine can bridge the gap where mm -hmm. you can have a, a specialist in Manila assisting a general practitioner, say, in a remote area. And because the doctors can speak each other's language, the specialist is able to get the information that, that, that he needs. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious also if you take that further, you can then consult a foreign doctor also. And I wonder... I think under the Philippine Medical uh, under the Philippine Medical Act that would be that would constitute uh, no, no, uh, illegal practice. Illegal practice. So what is important here is its application in the Philippines because when you have a license to practice medicine, then you can practice anywhere in the Philippines. And then the, the country being an archipelago composed of so many islands, you can do that because there is one uh, certification for everybody. Uh, it's different for for uh, telephone call, pa. it's different for uh, probably the U.S. or in the Philippines, and then you'll practice in the U.S. It's different. They they require a different, or you have to get a different kind of certification in terms of uh, medical practice. So, dito lang yan. You cannot practice as a doctor here in the Philippines and then go to what Guam, for example, because they have different certification. Dito lang sa Philippines lang probably it's most uh, conducive. There's a, there's a question here. I don't know the answer. Whether uh, medical devices, you know, these uh, machines, do they are they licensed by the FDA or are they licensed with uh, uh, the Department of Health? Uh, X-ray machines? Uh, I'm not sure. They should be under FDA kapag FDA. may mga, mga bagong devices na gagamitin. Because then the next question is, should the platforms now be registered with the FDA? That's a very good, seems like a good question. Yeah, well, I think there should be a regulatory agency no, for that. Uh, <laughs> Ivy? Or... Yes, Ivy. What do you think, Ivy? Hindi pa yung decide pero ako, ang personal thinking ko, yung telemedicine platform, wag na siguro kasi hindi naman siya like strictly a, a medical device. It's it's more of, of a platform and you're using the right. usual smart devices. No? Masyado ng madaming, alam mo yun, parang, you know, <laughs> you, you want yeah, to, no, medical device. Correct, correct. Too much regulation might might stifle the the industry I mean, in the sense that the, the industry is still trying to figure out what's the best way to serve the customer. If you give them enough breathing space, they'll figure it out. All these challenges, ma, ko close yung gap faster without regulation. I, I, I have a tendency to agree with that. Yes. Uh, this this morning, I, JJ, I learned that my favorite liver spread is not registered with the FDA, yung Reno pala. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't matter for me. I'll use it anyway. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I, uh, oh, if in one oh, click pala, pwedeng hindi ka na FDA, paano yan? <laughs> Oh, there's a question here that sort of uh, bridges the gap between uh, the two topics. Is a physician liable for medical malpractice in case of breach of patient privacy? 
I, uh, I think they can be, ano, uh, but yeah, Doc, ikaw na lang mag-answer. <laughs> yes. So, again, the um, passage of Data Privacy Act of uh, 2012 opened new areas for which the physician may be liable. No? And that is data liable against the provisions of the Data Privacy Act. Tapos yung dagdag pa doon, uh, even before the Data Privacy Act, ethical violation siya kasi against yung dinek siya ni... Uh, <laughs> confidentiality. <laughs> Joel, so since bawal siya sa medical ethics, then ground siya for suspension, revocation of license. I think there was a question here kanina, ano yung unprofessional conduct and all? Actually, yes. So, isang paper na ginawa namin together ni Doc Joel with Dr. Alvin Cavalis, malam, nalaman namin na napaka-broad ng kahit na, almost anything apparently can be a ground for ano uh, administrative liability kasi nap, napapasok sa unprofessional conduct. Uh, so, there's a very high bar that's required of doctors even in personal dealings and uh, social ano, social dealings. Yes. Like lawyers din. So, parang ganun. Ah, ganun ba? I thought lawyers had a lower, ano? <laughs> so, that's a good, for, for the two of you, that's a good question, right? Is it possible to lose your medical license but not use, lose your legal license on an act done outside your professional duties? I wonder, <laughs> I wonder which one is higher. Kala ko dati, like, halimbawa, ano ka, uh, nagalit sa'yo yung asawa mo, kayong dalawa, ingat kayo, so, di ba, pwede ka ma-disbar kasi ma marireklamo ka. Akala ko dati, pag doktor, hindi ko masyadong naririnig yung mga ganong cases na ma-disbar ka dahil sa immorality. Pero, you know, with, 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 with one case, we, we know that it has changed everything. So, almost, uh, biglang sinabi na lang ng court na there can be no dichotomy between your professional and personal life. So, thus, ganun na rin yung mga doctors. Parang pwede ka na rin mawalan ng license for well, pareho, the both no? their ethical violation <laughs> in medicine and in law. Oh, I was, I was hoping lawyers would have a higher degree of uh, tolerance for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, there's a there's a question here which is very is very uh, I think relevant question. Um, there are HMOs right now, uh, so people have you know MaxiCare, Telecare. Uh, we're not. I don't know, but but they have, they have this medical cards, right? And um, in tele, does telemedicine cover this now? Are, are you aware? I think some of them are already covering it. Tapos before that, eh, may mga HMOs na nakipartner dun sa mga ibang nagpo-provide. So pag yun yung kinuha mo, may, te, may coverage from the HMOs. Yun yung una. Then ngayon, nag-expand sila. I think more HMOs are covering... Uh, telemedicine consult now. Ang hindi pa rin yung PhilHealth. Okay. And then there's a... What we are seeing right now, JJ and I've yes. been, is the group practice among diff, um, on, uh, uh, same or similar specialty. So lahat halimbawa ng mga surgery or lahat ng ENT mag-group practice. In that way, they get to see the patient or um, nagpupul na mga na mga patients, so they get to see the patient every once a week or once every two weeks, so they don't have to expose them themselves unnecessarily. I, I'm sorry, are you saying that uh, telemedicine now is I, changing the way the doctors uh, collaborating? Did I did I? Well, uh, all of this came because of the pandemic, and there are yes. other ways by which you can decrease your exposure as a medical practitioner. No? And one of them, aside from telemedicine, I'm sorry this is off topic, aside from telemedicine, is grouping yourselves into a group practice of the same specialty. In that way, no? uh, for example, there are five of you, there are ten of you in the same specialty. So you pull your patient, you get to see, you get to go to the hospital, Every once, once every th every ten days. So till like that. Ah, okay. So that's interesting that uh, that uh, that sort of cooperation is happening uh, among doctors, and I think there's some concern that the pandemic will happen. Uh, it's likely to last for a long time because one of the things that uh, that do that lawyers do, but doctors don't, is lawyers organize professional partnerships. 
So I wonder if you know telemedicine or the pandemic will see the rise of doctors' professional partnerships. You think that, and and you know because you can collaborate, you can create a partnership across the country. So I have people in different places collaborating across a, a similar uh, practice group. Do you think that will happen? I think it's already happening, attorney. Uh, mas, uh, as Doc, Doc Joel said, mas dumami lang ngayon. No? But even before, nag-start na siya like uh, anesthesiologists, radiologists, uh, and now uh, even the other specialties also. And um, other than partnerships, minsan parang meron na rin akong na at least humingi ng advice sa akin ng corporation na uh, ang pag-organize. Form ng corporation. Uh, 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 doctors, no? So, and I guess with the, kumbaga pwede ka nang maging one man, baka mas maraming mag <laughs> ng corporation. So, Actually, the, the corporation might, yeah, yeah, might make sense if uh, if there's a machine, like they, they buy a particular machine or they invest there's a big investment they incorporate around that uh, that investment. Um, there's a there's a question. There's a series of questions here relating to medical records, and and uh, I'll, I'd like to divide that question into two. Uh, and of course, one aspect of that is the privacy, and I'd like uh, uh, Doctor Patu to uh, tackle the issue of because telemedicine, which means it's easier because the records are in electronic form. It's easier for the records to be shared and therefore easier. And of course, there's the data privacy risk, but I'd like to, uh, you to tackle that. And then Doc Joel, I'm hoping you can uh, explain uh, what, in what ways do you think platforms or providers of telemedicine uh, can use uh, patient information or at least what we anticipate them from a business uh, uh, standpoint. So Doc Ivy, maybe first on privacy. Uh, sorry, I, I, what, what so parang, you, there's uh, the, 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 so, the electronic medical records are very easily transported. Uh, of course, the, you mentioned, uh, no, data breach, uh, possibility. Uh, um, do you, do you think that there's, there is a bigger risk, uh, with electronic medical records versus paper records? No, even before the the more people doing telemedicine and you know, even the handling of paper based records and not electronic records, may risks na rin siya sa privacy. Now here for telemedicine, I see two two different scenarios. One is you're with a platform provider which has the EMR already. In which case, ang titingnan mo ngayon ano yung security measures na meron yung provider. So, marami sa kanila, for instance, sa sabihin we're HIPAA compliant. Parang kung sa US okay kami sa security measures. Uh, so, because that's a platform. Now, what about those others that you know have their own records? So, yung consultation nila hindi through a formal platform with an, or or a platform that does not have an incorporated EMR. So, dun natin pwede matulungan yung physicians on how to secure this data. Because they might be storing it just in their smart devices or in their, you know, in their laptops. So, tapos baka yung idea, no, making it a habit to password protect your files, maybe hindi pa siya habit. So, uh, so they, we, we, those aspects of the security of the digital data is important. How you transmit it, no? So, tinatransmit siya ngayon in practice sa Viber. No? So, how, for instance, Viber, Messenger, uh, email. So, how do you secure it? No? Uh, very basic in password protection. Of course, that's not enough. And they also have to be familiar with their devices and use other security measures. Like, uh, pag nawala yung cellphone mo, pwede mo, alam mo na ba kung paano siya i-wipe i remotely. You know, all these things. No? Th these are personal practices that uh, we can help decisions with no? na, na maging familiar sila. Sa umpisa, bago, parang mahirap. Pero actually, once we get used to it, and because everything's digital anyway, hindi lang sa practice, mga katulong in, in many other aspects. Can, can I, I, I think what you're, saying, what you're saying there is that uh, that's the value of a good telemedicine platform because the doctor doesn't have to worry about all of those issues. <laughs> huh? Not that I'm promoting, no? Kaya lang no, ha? no, no. I, uh, uh, <laughs> you these are to, pain you points. Be, you have to be the one securing everything, eh. Uh, otherwise, but it's still okay. No? Kaya naman din. Uh, kailangan mo lang malaman how to do it. Okay. Kay, kay Dr. Joel naman, my, my, my question was on the parang, uh, business aspect of the use of data, what do you, of, of these electronic records. 
Well, I was just about to comment that, uh, in fact, that is the primary thing about platform. When choosing a platform, choose the most secure uh, platform because any data that you give in or that is uh, processed in that platform, you know, information or data is money. Actually, some people can uh, get hold of it and can use it in such a way that they'll be earning more or they'll be earning from that. So, yun lang ang basic premise ko. So, data is money or information is money already. I don't know how people or people can be creative using it um, I cannot cite an example right now, but I'm sure there will be some person yeah. who will use that. Well, w one thing that comes to mind for me is uh, uh, AI. Uh, I think they they teach uh, AI to read uh, X-ray uh, images. Tapos, uh, supposedly, the AI can spot ano daw, lung cancer, even though it can't be seen by the human eye. So, because it, it, it uh, can uh, detect uh, minute changes that uh, that the human eye uh, cannot. So, but I think that's that that's a good use of data that actually increases uh, um, what do you call that patient care. So I think that 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 for a lot of people that the anxiety is on the the, the records uh, and they're concerned. There's a lot of concern here about data breach. Um, there, there should be a consent from the patient. Uh, yes. In order to use his or her data, if he, it will be used as a uh, experiment or as a uh, AI technology, then there should be always be a consent. So, kasi empre at ni JJ pag AI na yung pinag-usapan, mm -hmm. uh, tapos fully automated decision making sa Pilipinas, kailangan mo inutify yung NPC only because can you imagine at this point that only a, kahit na ano mang you know. You have to examine also the studies that will tell you na kung gaano ka accurate yung AI. Pero kailangan yata meron pa ring human intervention, especially if uh, critical cases. Uh, I think yun yung danger. That's a very good. Yeah, fully That's automated right. decision making. You know, uh, about bawa ikaw at ni JJ, would you trust the AI which says it can detect the very minute changes versus a pulmonologist practicing and updated and one of the best pulmonologists. Parang yeah, I, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think now where in my life do I trust AI. I'm sure there are things I do now that's, that's driven by AI. Kaya lang, uh, that fact is unknown to me. <laughs> I mean, the providers are not telling us that, that this is AI driven. But well, TikTok, TikTok is AI driven. So if you enjoy TikTok, that's AI telling, figuring out what you like to watch. Uh, I think also ano, uh, Facebook, what appears on your, uh, no, on your timeline is based on AI. But yeah, when it, but that's just for entertainment, right? When it comes to your health, you want, you want uh, somebody with a, with a degree, not somebody who was trained by uh, <laughs> computers. It's pictures lang yun. Malamang eh, diba? So, right. Yeah, let's see. Attorney Jay, uh, question sure. on brief, very briefly lang. Ang notification ng National Privacy Commission is usually 72 hours from a reasonable belief that a breach has occurred. So if you think may compromised data, uh, kahit hindi pa kompleto yung information mo, you can already inform the National Privacy Commission and, and you know maybe ask guidance from them on, on what to do about it. There's yeah, actually, uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Initial notification and the final notification, which is five days, five days later, uh, Attorney Patio. Mm. Three uh, days. Pero ka naman, you know, if, because really, alam naman natin na sometimes it takes a while to investigate breaches, no? lalo na kung hindi papel lang na nawala. So you can also, I think, ask for an extension dun sa additional five days na binigay. As long as na-notify mo na sila, they will take into consideration the circumstances and allow you uh, extension dun sa, sa... Do you expect a lot more breaches this time of pandemic rather than before? Let's see kung anong data na meron, no? Pero, tsaka kung anong klase ngayon yung mga breaches na meron. It, um, um, a lot. breach kasi can be, can be just inadvertence, eh. Somebody forgot a, uh, a password. Even in very secure organizations uh, or very advanced organizations, merong mga, some people forget a folder that's open, walang password, accessible. In fact, that's what happened in the Comelic, uh, no, which... Uh, 
uh, uh, Dr. Ivy worked on. It was a, a resource that was inadvertently left uh, uh, open. So, may risk. It could be the platform has that risk. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to ask a question about, ano nga, uh, about that. Because I think that's one of the, the other concerns, yung uh, electronic me uh, medical records. Uh, ah, sorry, the other thing pala I was thinking about was, uh, I'm sure as doctors, you would, uh, you would be concerned about complying with the Data Privacy Act. And I, I understand that individual physicians are registering themselves as uh, data privacy controllers. And I'm wondering now whether doing telemedicine might relieve them of those obligations because now they can just push everything now to the to the telemedicine so it's a it's actually a benefit to to doctors to use telemedicine uh, by pushing a lot of the data privacy obligations to to a provider well, i think ang magiging setup jan personal information processing uh, telemedicine platform right. the main obligation parin will still be in the on the physician to ensure that the platforms are safe and secure. So right, yung, right. Naman, you know, but it, it's sabi mo nga, parang sometimes lang, mas madali na i-platform mo siya kasi yung mga security measures, you know that it's a yes. high level uh, and you like constantly securing every data you have. So I don't know, for for, for people that are um, yung, yung ano sa technology, gusto nila yun, no? Uh, may, may mistrust yung iba sa cloud or and, and, but a reliable provider definitely has more security than you in your home. There's, there's a question here about wearables. Uh, are, they, ano daw, are they accurate? Um, yung mga wearables, uh, I think they track, uh, some, some of them track sleep, some of them uh, take your... Monitoring, that's also one of the uses. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, effect, uh, effective. Of course, kailangan mo siyang maybe more on the trend, yung changes. Okay. Uh, I mean, in the same way that when you take your BP, hindi pare-pareho yung kuha. Like, kung si Doc Joe nag-BP sa'yo, tapos ako after, baka magkaiba yung makuha namin. Uh, pero sa tingin ko, acceptable yung mga magiging uh, risks niyan. Ako, I, I'm wondering... Oh, go ahead, Doc. Go ahead. I'm wearing a wearable actually to track my uh, heart rate. Because uh, there was a time that uh, medyo nagkaroon ako ng, ano, ng increase in heart rate. So right now, I'm wearing a watch na para lagi kong nache-check even the waveform. So mm. I guess somebody will just uh, look at this data and then convert it into something which you can send uh, through telemedicine to the physician. And then that is a one way of uh, monitoring the vital signs of the patient. Yes. Actually, one of the things that uh, when you look at the development of technology in the last 20 or 30 years, everything has miniaturized. Your music is miniaturized, mobile phone, everything. But as a medical field, how come, you know, it's really one of the mysteries. I, I don't expect you to know the answer, but I think I have a clue now. Eh? Uh, how come there are no uh, portable, uh, what's that? Uh, um, um, uh, ultrasound machines. Ultrasound. How come there are no portable, yung mga ganong devices? And I'm thinking maybe now with telemedicine, those devices will be marketed, will be developed and marketed because there's a need now for perhaps the patient himself to, to operate that. You know, there are portable ultrasound <laughs> machines that are handheld then, no? So, oh, okay. residents, uh, of course, they are well versed in using the big uh, ultrasound machines, but then meron ng mga model na maliliit lang talaga. Ah, so, okay. Angel, pwede um, niyan. Iba, binibili lang ng, ng person. Gusto nila na may ganun sila na, na device at home. Yung iba. So, na, na, nakakaya na siya. No? Meron na, meron ng mga ganun. Siguro, we, we want more. We want more, more yeah. devices that are uh, how about, sorry, uh, how about quality of life? Uh, I think uh, there was a study that came out recently that the average work day has actually increased by 48 minutes every day. So people were working this much and then it increased by about an hour every day. Uh, how about for doctors? 
do you find that physicians now with telemedicine are enjoying a higher quality of life or or professional uh, exp- you know the professional uh, quality of professional life well i i don't think so for telemedicine what i uh, i'm looking at is the group practice aspect so that you can enjoy a uh, good quality of life in terms of more time with your family rather than be well let's just say it exposed to the elements exposed to covid when you hmm. uh, are uh, when you are in the open so siguro in that aspect yes now as for my associates here in the legal department of well, uh, ano uh, they are work from home two times a week so hmm. probably they have good quality of life but then as for me i use that to catch up catch up with my work yung mga things that i have to read things that i have to review contracts lahat yon so i do that during my work from home doc sa telemed depende siguro sa doctor yon uh, attorney jj kasi yung mga kilala ko nandito sa bahay namin parang mas nag-extend yung clinic hours kasi sometimes the patient will want to consult at uh, beyond the usual clinic hours eh syempre tinitingnan pa rin naman so i think it depends on the doctor but for some i don't think it ano it decreases the time parang nag-extend just like us i mean you know ta- si yeah. sabi ni, ni Doc Joel ganun diba parang mas tumagal yung mga mas maraming meetings ka nang inaattendan sa isang araw <laughs> that's right that's right more meetings Uh, yeah, because before you used to spend a lot of time in the car, parking, walking up to the meetings, waiting for people to arrive. So uh, in that sense, it's more uh, more efficient. Um, so we're running out, we're running out of time. Can I just uh, ask uh, uh, both of you to just uh, have any if you have any parting thoughts uh, for our audience? I know there's still a lot of questions that we weren't able to to answer, but if you have any parting thoughts. Uh, You know, uh, if you could give them maybe ladies first, uh, Dr. Patu. For my parting words, gusto kong sagutin yung isang tanong na what about charge of consultation in telemedicine? Uh, you know, they charge the same. And then for the patients here, uh, siguro yung iba nagbaba, pero most will charge the same. And for the patients here, don't feel that you're you're like, you know, it's unfair that you're being charged the same because... The risks also that the doctors will have to take when they do telemedicine. It's the same. It's the same risk. It's the same care they will give you. So, ah, uh, same man yung consultation charges ng doctors. You know, it's I think uh, okay lang yon. Um, and my parting words is I hope we do not become afraid of technology and everything that it can promise. It's an exciting field, and uh, if we learn to maximize its benefits while protecting people's privacy. Uh, especially in the field of telemedicine, um, mukhang magiging revolutionary siya for healthcare. Siya yan lang. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Doc Joel? Yes, I'd just like to say that uh, telemedicine, we should embrace it. It's maybe an exciting development in the practice of medicine. And uh, for questions, you might you might want to just email me. That's jumacalino at uh, up.edu.ph. PH. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ol. So, uh, that's another uh, episode of uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. Um, we're very happy with uh, uh, today's, uh, no, I mean, it, I, I, feel, I felt very strongly that we had to do uh, a session on uh, telemedicine and the advances in, uh, in uh, the medical field. There's still a lot of things going on, uh, a lot of uh, other developments. Uh, next week, join us. Uh, we have a, a show next week on uh, digital banking, that other thing that uh, everyone is getting uh, concerned about. Um, so on that note, we'd like to uh, end this session. And uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.